O.J. Simpson. Fact or fiction? March 11, 2018, Fox Television broadcast an interview with O.J. Simpson, filmed in 2006, about the book If I Did It, which offers a hypothetical, fictional account of the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman. This hypothetical account of the murders that Judith Regan interviewed O.J. Simpson about is contained in the 2006 version of the book, not the re-edited version of the book that Fred and Kim Goldman published in 2007. Using the original version of If I Did It, we will compare and contrast the story of the murders told in the 2006 version of the book with the actual facts and evidence. The time of 10.03 p.m. is the first key point that the writer of If I Did It makes in Chapter 6. At 10.03 p.m., the Charlie character unexpectedly stops by 360 North Rockingham Avenue. Although the true identity of Charlie is never revealed, we think that the four best possibilities are Charlie Rose, Charlie Sheen, Charlie Corsmo, who played the nerdy kid who got drunk for the first time in the 1998 film Can't Hardly Wait, and finally, Charlie Brown. Charlie tells the OJ character that Nicole is out of control. She's drinking, doing drugs, and having a lot of kinky sex. This upsets the OJ character, and the two drive in the Bronco to Nicole's condo. The writer of If I Did It claims that they parked the Bronco next to a chain-link fence in the alley behind Nicole's condo. The writer of If I Did It claims that the back gate was broken. Is this true? Let's go to the videotape. Did you step if you step up the path, sir, are there, is there a gate that you come to before you should come to the body of the victim? Yes, there's a gate uh, to the east of where the victims were located uh, that I found to be wide open uh, at the time. Uh, the gate is serviceable and uh, could be locked from the inside and open from the inside without a key. However, from the outside, one would need a key. Uh, additionally, there's an outside latch that would have to be activated in order to get in after one would key their way in or someone on the inside would uh, allow them to go in. You observe the operation of that gate, I take it, personally? Yes. Is there a way from which, from the inside of the house, you can press a button to open the gate electronically? There is an inside release button, uh, but I could not activate it. To me, it was unserviceable at that time. And at that time was what time? Well, the uh, morning of the crime scene investigation and during subsequent visits to the crime scene. So as of June 13th, the morning of June 13th, you found the release button uh, on the inside of the residence to be inoperable. That is, it would not open the gate. Yes. And based on your observation, you were able to manually unlatch the gate? if you went down to it and unlatched it? From the inside? Yes. Yes. But you would have to do that in order to open it? Well, you'd it. have to. The, the inner knob is a smooth knob. The outer knob towards the street is, is keyed. So from the inside, you could open it by the, the, uh, the knob, but one would have to, if they were opening it from the inside, reach over the gate and undo the latch that's on the outside of the gate. As well? Yes. After you go up those stairs, if you were going to go to the back alley, you ha can you describe the path that you would take? To the back alley from that location? Yes. Yes, there are three or four steps leading above uh, where she was located uh, to a porch area, and then there are, I believe, two more steps up another area towards the front door which would be off to one's left if you're walking in a westerly direction. Uh, that pathway uh, continues westerly to the point where there is a small latched gate. Uh, one would go through the latched gate and then descend uh, several steps to a lower area where the housekeeper's quarters uh, would probably be located uh, and proceed along that area to a point where there are some more steps going up, another level area, 
and one would uh, eventually reach a uh, locking gate similar to the front gate uh, located at the uh, northwest uh, corner of the property. Uh, this particular uh, gate uh, had a uh, deadbolt lock, again, uh, accessible from the inside and not the outside. The next key assertion by the writer of If I Did It is that Ronald Goldman entered through the back gate and that the murders occurred near the back gate. Let's take a closer look at the layout of 875 South Bundy Drive. As you can see, it's a very long condo. When one enters the back gate, they have to go down six steps. This landing is the location of the housekeeper maid's quarters. Then one has to climb up six steps to reach the family living area. The door you can see is off of the kitchen. Continue down two steps and the windows on the left is where the living room is located. Down another four steps, you arrive at the front gate. The murders occurred at the front gate, not the back gate. Ron Goldman entered through the front gate. The writer of If I Did It has the OJ character black out during the murders, and the character's next realization is that he is covered in blood. The OJ character says, quote, My shirt and pants were sticking to my skin. Even my shoes were covered in blood. At some point between 10.15 and 10.20 p.m., the OJ character is startled by the plaintiff wail of a dog. Ironically, the ghostwriter picked by Harper Collins to write If I Did It was also a witness in the criminal trial. Pablo Fenvez was one of the only witnesses to claim that he heard the plaintiff wail of a dog between 10.15 and 10.20 p.m. Does Pablo Fenvez's claim hold up? Let's go to the videotape. I was living on Gretna Greenway and uh, Bundy has a common back alley. And as I said in court, it was about 10.15 or 10.20. I heard this very unhappy sounding dog. Obviously, the murders had already taken place. And uh, well, in retrospect, the dog was, you know, patting around in the blood and, and confused and, you know, looking for help. And I helped establish uh, a timeline that made it possible for OJ to have committed the crime. Directing your attention, sir, to the evening of June the 12th, 1994, Sunday night. Can you tell us where you were in the evening, sir? I was home late. Can you tell us what you were doing at about 10 o'clock? I had just turned on the Channel 5 News. The Channel 5 News? Yes. And where were you watching television at that time? Upstairs in the bedroom with my wife. At some point <clears throat> while you were watching the 10 o'clock news on Channel 5, did something distract you? Uh, yes, about 15 or 20 minutes into it, um, I heard a dog barking, a sort of a plaintive wail. Now, had dogs barked in that neighborhood before, sir? Uh, yes, but this was a pretty persistent barking that just uh, wouldn't stop. You described it as a plaintive wail? Yes. So it was an unusual sound of bark to you? Right. And that was at about 10.15 to 10.20? Yes. Did the barking stop or did it continue? Uh, well, about this time I stopped watching the news and went down to my office. And uh, I did a little work and I didn't come back upstairs till about 11 o'clock. At the point that you went downstairs to do some work, was the barking still going on? Yes, it was. Parade of Nicole Brown Simpson's neighbors takes center stage to dispute the prosecution's carefully laid out timeline theory. O.J. Simpson has no alibi between 9.35 p.m. when he returns from McDonald's with Kato Kalin until 10.55 when he emerges from his house to rush to the airport saying he'd overslept. The prosecution says Simpson committed the murders during that window of opportunity. In fact, they pinpoint 10.15 p.m. as the time of the killings because that's when Nicole's neighbors report hearing barking dogs. But... The defense says they can prove the murders took place almost half an hour later than 10.15 at about 10.40. Let the record reflect, we've now been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. 
To do this, the dream team calls an unlikely pair. I was on a first date and I picked up Ellen Aronson. We had a date once. <laughs> so to <laughs> speak. <laughs> Danny Mandel and Ellen Aronson were on a blind date the night of the murders. They went to Mezzaluna, the same restaurant where Ron Goldman worked, and Nicole Brown Simpson had her last meal. What time did you leave the restaurant? Approximately 10.15. And did you refresh your memory in some way uh, to get that time? Yes, I did. And how did you refresh your memory? Well, by when I looked at the credit card receipt and the time stamp on it. The pair then walked back to Aronson's house. Along the way, they passed directly by 875 South Bundy, Nicole Brown Simpson's condominium. How long did it take, if you know, from the restaurant to 875 South Bundy? It took us 15 minutes. That puts them within 50 feet of the murder scene at about 10.30 that night, a time the prosecution says was punctuated by barking dogs and general pandemonium. When you walked by that area, did you notice anything unusual? No. Did you hear anything unusual? No. Did you hear any barking dogs? None. The news reports were saying that there was a dog barking, that there were lights on a Bronco. Uh, I think they said the hazards were on, the lights were blinking. At the point that I was at that street, on the street, there was nothing. It was an extremely quiet evening, out of a movie. The next witness is Francesca Harmon, a hotel manager who was attending a dinner party just up the street from Nicole Brown Simpson's condominium. And what time did you leave the dinner party? 10.15. Harmon says it was 10.20 by the time she got in her car, removed the club anti-theft device, and drove past 875 South Bundy. Did you hear the sound of a barking dog? No, I did not. Did you hear the wailing of a dog? No, I did not. Denise Pilnack lives a few houses down the street from Nicole Brown Simpson's condominium. My mother um, was in from the Midwest with her husband, and they were staying at my sister's. They came over, and we ended up having dinner. Uh, what time did you finish dinner at Louise's, if you know, and what time did you arrive back home? Um, we finished dinner sometime around close to 9.30 and got home just a couple minutes after. It only takes about three minutes. You then returned home. Did you return home in the company of anyone else? Yes. And who was that? Uh, my girlfriend was over, Judy T. Lander. She had joined us for dinner. She'd been over all day. At some point after you returned home from dinner with Judy T. Lander, did your mom and Nick have occasion to leave your residence from the 900 block of, of South Bundy? Yes, they did. Can you tell the jury and the court and jury about what time they left your residence that evening? Um, when we came back, they just came in for about five minutes, so it was around 9.45 to 10 to 10. Now, after they left, did you have occasion to uh, see what time it was after that as you looked toward getting, obtaining some messages from your machine? Um, I did look at the clock because my girlfriend had been over all day using my computer. What time was that that you looked at the clock? 10.18. And what happened at 10.18, please? Um, well, Judy had been over all day, and I noticed the uh, digital time, I said, I said to her, Judy, it's 10:18. You've been here all day, and I'm going out of town in a couple days. You're going to have to leave. So. And so uh, you parted company at about what time? 10:21. All right. And uh, again, you're pretty sure about that time? Um, well, I I retimed everything. My little speech to her took about 45 seconds, and the printing out um, was a minute and 25 seconds for each three-page copy. So that's, that's right about three minutes. Right, so after the fact, you went back and redid these things mm -hmm. yourself. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh means yes? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Did you escort her out or tell us what you did when Judy T. Lander was leaving? Um, whenever my girlfriends leave my home, I always turn off the porch light, stand on the porch, watch them till they get in their car and take off, and then I make them call me when they get home, just so I know they're safe. Now, when you walked out and you're on the porch uh, with Judy T. Lander, can you describe for the jury uh, the condition of Bundy Drive that particular night, that Sunday evening? Um, that Sunday evening, it was exceptionally quiet. As long as I've lived in that home, I never remember a night when it was absolutely still. There wasn't a sound to be heard. All right, now, and what time is this that it's exceptionally quiet? Um, it was about 
Judy and I were outside talking, probably between 1021 and about 1025. Now, with regard to the time of 1015, at which time you've indicated you were still in your house, did you hear a dog barking at all at that time? No. And when you came out on that porch with Judy Tlander, and that was, I think you told us, between 1021 and 1025, you didn't hear any dogs barking at that time, did you? No, we commented on how quiet it was. And when you say we, you're talking about you and Judy Judy and I commented. Your mom and Nick had left at something like 945 to 950, is that correct? Yes. And uh, <laughs> after Judy T. Lander left, you then called your mom at some location, is that correct? Yes. Okay, and what time was it that you called your mother? 1025. And uh, you have provided us with a phone bill. Can you look at that, please? Yes. Okay, tell us, tell the jury what that is. Um, that's my phone bill. All right, that's your phone bill. And what's the date of that phone bill? Uh, the date of the phone bill, well, the bill date is July 10th, but it includes calls from June 10th through uh, June 15th on this page. You have a phone call about June 12th, uh, 1994, at about 10.25 p.m.? Yes, I do. Where, where is that call to? It's to my sister's house. Is that where your mom was? Yes. Did you connect with your mom and she made it? Yes, I did. And so this phone bill indicates the time that you call your mother at 10.25 p.m. It says Gardena on it with a phone number. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, look at that phone bill and tell us um, how long you talked uh, at 10.25 on the phone. Three minutes. Is that about accurate? Yes. All right. And after that, now that would make it about 10.28. Is that correct? Yes. All right, and tell us then what happened after you placed this phone call to your mother. Well, actually, while I was speaking with my mother, it was a portable phone. I uh, washed four glasses and put them away, crystal glasses, and I washed my face, brushed my teeth, flossed, and, and then I um, went into the kitchen to bring a bunch of newspapers and reading material into my bedroom and put those uh, in the bedroom and then I went back into the bathroom. Now, up to that time, ma'am, up to the time that you picked these newspapers up and you brushed your teeth and floss and everything, had you heard any loud uh, dogs barking at that time? No. Was it still very quiet out? I wasn't outside, but it was, I didn't hear any noises from outside. You couldn't hear anything from inside, is that correct? Correct. And when you had been out on your porch, when Judy T. Lander had left, had it been very, very quiet? Uh, extremely quiet. All right. Now, at some point thereafter, did you hear uh, a dog or dogs start barking? When I went back into the bathroom, I was drying my hands, and I heard a dog barking. All right. And to the best of your recollection, what time was that that you heard this dog barking at that point? Your best recollection. About 10.35. All right. And as you can tell, that was the earliest it was? It could be 10.33, because right. I've retimed those activities. All right. So between 10.33 and 10.35, is that correct? Yes. All right. And uh, you never came outside to check that dog, did you? No. All right. You just heard the dog barking? Yes. And did, they, did you hear this sound of barking? Did it continue for a period of time? It continued for a long time. All right. Her friend, Judy T. Lander, backs her up. It was very quiet. In fact, Denise and I had commented when we walked out to my car about how quiet, and it was that kind of misty kind of L.A. evening where um, almost like a Halloween night, and I think I made a comment, or she did, that it was almost eerie. It was so quiet. Conveniently, at 10.37 p.m., the writer of If I Did It has the O.J. and Charlie characters drive by in the Bronco as limo driver Alan Park is pulling into the Ashford Street gate. Let's go to the videotape. What happened next? Uh, I had a little bit of time, so I just stepped out of the car and had a cigarette and listened to the radio for a little bit. And when you stepped out of the car, where did you go? I just went to the back of the the limousine, sat on the curb. And after you finished your cigarette, what did you do? I uh, got back in the car and proceeded to wait another five minutes or so, or at about 10.40 is when I pulled up to the front gate. After 
I came around first. I came around Ashford onto Rockingham, looked in the driveway, and it just didn't look accessible as the other driveway. So I backed up and came back over to Ashford. All right, so you got back in your car about what time after having the cigarette? 10, just before 10.40. And what did you do then? Just what I told you. You drove down Ashford? Yes, made a left on Rockingham. Looked at the driveway and just, it didn't look, look easy to get into, so I backed straight back up and went back to uh, the Ashford gate. So was it 10.40 at the point when you reached the Rockingham gate? It was, you know, about the time. It was, there was only a 30 second interview, inter interval or so from me coming from this gate going back to there. It was about 1040 when I pulled up to the gate on Ashford. The OJ and Charlie characters park the Bronco on Bristol, across from the house owned by the Von Watts family, who live directly behind OJ's house. The OJ character instructs the Charlie character to park the Bronco in the driveway after he leaves in the limo. Did Charlie park in the driveway? Let's go to the videotape. But CNN has learned that bungled handling of Simpson's white Bronco towed in for testing before his arrest may help even the score for the defense. Nope, the Charlie character parked the Bronco next to the Rockingham gates. Perhaps the most bizarre claim made by the writer of If I Did It is the route that he suggests that the OJ character took in order to enter 360 North Rockingham without being seen by the limo driver. This map shows the route described in the book. The writer has the OJ character follow the hidden pathway which friends of OJ Simpson used to, in order to play tennis when OJ Simpson was out of town. From Bristol Street, they would walk along the fence between the Von Watts property and Ashford. This would take them to the gate between the Von Watts tennis court and O.J. Simpson's tennis court. The writer has the O.J. character pass both the tennis court and the pool and travel all the way to the end of O.J. Simpson's property behind the guest houses. The writer, for some unknown reason, has the O.J. character run into the air conditioner behind Cato Kalen's guest house. Next, the O.J. character turns around walking into 360 North Rockingham using the back door. This is the least logical route possible. Also, if one is covered in blood, dressed in only his socks and underwear, and they're trying not to leave a trail of evidence, wouldn't he just jump in the pool? This would remove all traces of blood from his person, and the chlorine in the pool would dilute the blood immediately, leaving absolutely no evidence behind. Let's go to the videotape to hear Cato talk about the three thumps. Who did you call? Uh, my friend Rachel. And what time was it when you called her? I called her at about 10, 10, around there. During that phone call, did something unusual occur? Yeah, I uh, heard a noise. Now, how long had you been talking to your friend Rachel when you heard that noise? It was probably a uh, half hour into the conversation. Okay, so about 10.40 or so you heard a noise? It's about that time. Can you describe for us the noise you heard, Mr. Kalin? It was, um, it, you know, in my room, it has this uh, wall and it's uh, like that. For the record, noise. the witness thumped on the witness stand with his fist. And you hit the witness stand like three times or so. Was that three noises that you heard? I believe it was three noises. It was thumping. It sounded like three thumps. Yes. And where did the thumps seem to come from? Right behind my, the bedroom wall, uh, where my bed would be. Okay. Um, you said you have an air conditioning unit in a hole in the wall? Yes. Was it in the same wall that the air conditioning unit was in? Yes. Was it near the air conditioning unit that the thumps seemed to come from? Yes. Did O.J. open the gate for the limo driver? Let's go to the videotape. Well, I got back out of the car and uh, buzzed the gate again. At that time, I got an answer. Now, wait. How long was it between the time you saw the person enter the front door, the lights went on, you buzzed the gate? 
how much time elapsed between the lights going on and the person entering the front door and you buzzing the gate? Uh, 15, 20 seconds. So 15 or 20 seconds after the person entered the house, you buzzed the gate? Yes. What happened then? Uh, the intercom was answered by uh, what I believe was Mr. Simpson. And uh, he told me that he, he overslept and he just got out of the shower and that he'd be, out in, uh, be down in a minute. After you had the conversation with Mr. Simpson, what happened next? Uh, I got back in the car and waited for the gate to be open, which still took another 30 seconds or so. At some point, did the male white open the gate for you? Yes, he did. When you turned around and came back from the garage, you went and opened the gate for the limo driver? Yes. He drove in? Yes, he did. The book claims that O.J. called Cato from the limo, but was unable to reach him. Did O.J. speak with Cato? Let's go to the videotape. After the defendant left, what did you do? Oh, I got back on the phone. I went to my room on the phone. Again? Again? <laughs> Who did you call? Uh, Rachel. Okay. Was that call interrupted? Yes. How? Um, OJ had called uh, and said that he forgot to alarm, so I should alarm the house. He, the defendant called to say that you should set the alarm on the house? Yes. Had you ever done that before? <coughs> uh, no. So did you know how to set the alarm on the house? No. Did he explain how? Yes. And did he have to give you some instructions or a code or something? A, a code. And did he give you that code? Yes. The book claims that, quote, a limo driver met OJ at O'Hare Airport in order to take him to the O'Hare Plaza Hotel. Is this correct? Let's go to the videotape. Cut, 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 cut. Now, you had a chance to see Mr. Simpson when he first came off of the airplane. Yes. You had a chance to see him for the time while you waited for the bags to come. Yes. About how much time did it take for the bags to come, did you say? Approximately 10 minutes. You had a chance to see Mr. Simpson while you and he were inside your car traveling to his hotel. Yes. Did you have a chance to see Mr. Simpson as he interacted with the guests at the hotel? Yes, I did. During the entire time that you interacted with Mr. Simpson that morning, did you notice anything unusual about his hands? No, I did not. Did you notice any, any cuts on the middle finger of his left hand? No. I want to show you a photograph that is People's Exhibit 123, and you can look on the monitor to your <clears> right. <throat> Looking at the picture that is Exhibit 123 shown on the monitor there, do you see what appears to be some sort of mark on Mr. Simpson's finger? Yes. During the time that you saw Mr. Simpson when he came off of the airplane at baggage claim and in the car and in the hotel, did you have occasion to see such a mark on his finger? No. Now, there were several occasions when you were with Mr. Simpson as he was interacting with others. Yes. He would sign autographs. Yes. He would sign autographs. Would he sign autographs by holding something in his hand? Well, he would have to hold a piece of paper in his hand, obviously, to write it. So there'd be the opportunity for you to watch the, the, the act of his signing the autographs? Yes. Was there ever an occasion when you consciously averted your eyes from watching his hands as he was signing autographs? Uh, I was watching a lot of things. You didn't ignore his hands, did you? No, I did not. But there was nothing about his hands that drew any attention to you? Objection that's leading. Rephrase the question. Sure. Was there anything about his hands that drew your attention? Uh, just the fact that they're big. They're good. Yep. You did notice that, they're, that he has pretty large hands? Yes. You watched him shaking hands? Yes. You watched him signing? Yes. You saw no cuts? I saw no Objection cuts. Leading. Cut, 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 cut. Was it Lang or Van Adder who called OJ in Chicago? Let's go to the videotape. And armed with the information given to you by Kathy Randa with regard to the hotel, you then were able to get the hotel information. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. 
So you then placed a call to the hotel in Chicago, is that correct? Yes, sir. You were connected to an operator, were you not? Someone who answered the phone at the hotel, yes. And did you ask for Mr. O.J. Simpson's room? Yes, I did. You told Mr. Simpson, according to your statement, that uh, you gave him your name, is that correct? Yes, sir. You told him that uh, you had to relay some bad information to him, is that correct? That's correct. All right, and then thereafter, you then, at some point in the conversation, said to Mr. Simpson that your ex-wife, Nicole, had been killed, is that correct? Yes, sir. And when you said that, Mr. Simpson became very, very upset on the phone, isn't that correct? Yes, he did. In fact, yesterday you said that he became understandably, or you expected that he would be upset by this information, isn't that correct? That's correct. And in becoming upset, he said to you, what do you mean she's been killed? He asked you that right off, didn't he? What do you mean she's been killed? Well, he, he, kept, he kept repeating himself and talking to himself over and over and over. And referring to your report, when it says, Mr. Simpson replied, what do you mean she's been killed? Uh, do you remember him saying that? You wrote that in your report? Okay. Do you remember that? Uh, yes. Okay. And when he, when he said, what do you mean she's been killed, did you say, Mr. Simpson, I'm going to tell you all about this? I'm going to tell you exactly what happened, how many people were killed? You didn't say that, did you? I never had a chance. All right. But you never said that, did you? I never had a chance, and I never said it. I never said it, and you didn't know at that point, did you? You did couldn't not have know the means by which they had been killed. Right, because 45 minutes later, when you're talking to the coroner, you said they may have been bludgeoned at the shot. Isn't that correct? Did not know the means by which they had been right. killed, sir. So you never responded to O.J. Simpson's request, what do you mean she's been killed? And is it your statement that he was upset at that point, was he not? Yes, he was. As you expected. And then he went on to say, oh, my God, Nicole is dead. Oh, my God. And he continued repeating himself in an upset fashion. Isn't that correct? Yes, he did. And at some point, didn't you try to get him to get hold of himself from an emotional standpoint? Yes, I did. And he kept repeating himself. She's been killed. What do you mean she's been killed? Oh, my God. Nicole is dead. And he repeated himself over and over again. That's correct. As you can clearly see, the unreleased 2006 version of If I Did It is riddled with significant mistakes. The claim that the murders had ended between 10.15 and 10.20 p.m. is perhaps the most significant, given the fact that it was impossible for Ron Goldman to arrive to Nicole Simpson's condo before 10.30 p.m. To understand why this would be impossible, read Timeline June 12, 1994, at ojsimpson.co. The writer of this chapter chose to exclude the most credible evidence in order to support his debunked claim that the murders were complete no later than 10.20 p.m. The route that the writer has the OJ character take in order to enter Rockingham without being seen by the limo driver is perhaps the best evidence that this chapter was not written by OJ Simpson because the writer is clearly not familiar with the layout of 360 North Rockingham. O.J. Simpson has always maintained that he was not the writer of the chapter of If I Did It, focused on the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. Based on this fact check of the chapter about the murders, there is a very good chance that he is telling the truth. For more, visit ojsimpson.co.